That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem, which is the directorial debut of... <laughs> that was a meaty introduction. Okay. Well, you know, I like, I like meaty. Uh, it's the directorial debut of Jeff Rowe. It was co-directed by Kyle Spears. Mr. Rowe uh, previously wrote The Mitchells vs. The Machines, which Mr. Spears also worked on in the art department, I believe. Uh, notably, this is the seventh theatrical release dealing with the TMNT team uh, and is being released courtesy of Paramount on August 2nd, 2023. Directorial debut. Mm -hmm. Excellent work. Mm -hmm. uh, the IMDb description. The Turtle Brothers as they work to earn the love of New York City while facing down an army of mutants. That's not a very good description. No. So now that uh, our reviews on YouTube are tomato meter approved on Rotten Tomatoes, we have to have pull quotes. And I figured it might be easiest to just say the pull quote straight away. So my pull quote is, this is the perfect dose of humor, nostalgia, and humanity I didn't know I needed. What's your pull quote? I would say that it is a heartwarming coming of age story story that exemplifies the power of allyship and acceptance. Oh, okay. Fancy. Mm. All right. So this is basically like an origin story. So there is this geneticist named Baxter Stockman, I think. Who is voiced by Giancarlo Esposito. Who I thought... <laughs> as soon as he came on screen, Joseph goes, ooh. Ooh, because I thought he looked like Ren from Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a, a, a lonely boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's homely. But anyway, he's a geneticist and he and he's lonely, so he's created friends in the way of these mutant animals. And he does that by exposing them to some ooze. Like Dr. Moreau. Mm -hmm. So there is an agency called TCRI. Mm -hmm. Techno Cosmic Research <laughs> Institute. Oh, Salud. Me. They want this technology. So they raid his place. And in the process seemingly destroy everything and we see one final vial of um or one remaining vial of the ooze go down into the sewer the green slime and of course it comes in contact with four turtles and a rat mm -hmm. then we flip fast forward 15 years and we see that the rat splinter has become the father of the four teenage mutant ninja turtles and he has experience with humans as a mutant splinter does the rat and it was not positive. Like, the humans tried to kill him. So he has vowed to protect his children, the four turtles, by basically saying you can never go up to, like, ground level and be around humans. Yeah. But, of course, teenagers are teenagers. They want to be free. So they do go out at night to get food and stuff and do other things. And one night they bump into a human teenager named April. April O'Neil. Uh, and, by the way, he's taught them martial arts so they can protect themselves. Yes. Yeah. So she... They end up saving her because her, like, her bike gets and her backpack gets stolen. And she says, well, I'm an aspiring journalist. Why don't you let me write a story about you and show that you're he heroes and the humans will like you? Well, how are they going to be heroes? We find out there's some nefarious entity stealing a bunch of like high-tech equipment. So Baxter, the geneticist, when his lab was destroyed, there were other mutants in the lab, mm -hmm. like a rhinoceros, a, a fly, a, a lizard thing, something. Mm -hmm. Rocksteady and Bebop or the... Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of those creatures grew up just like uh, the turtles did. And their leader is Superfly, voiced by Ice Cube. Oh my God. Who needs to get like an Academy Award for this. It's so good. It's so it The voice work performance is exceptional. Yes. Mm -hmm. But his plan, he's the one stealing all this high-tech equipment because he wants to create technology that will turn all animals on Earth into mutants, which will then kill all the humans. But of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles want to stop him. They end up getting Superfly's mutants to be on their side. Mm -hmm. So all of them, including humans, help defeat Superfly, the end. So it's pretty simple, but the post credit scenes are quite... Uh, there's a lot going on in the post credit scenes. Because we see that the four turtles go to high school. Mm -hmm. They make friends. They go to prom. Then we see the TCRI. Uh, who's run by a character named Cynthia... <laughs> who's voiced by uh, Maya Rudolph with a German accent. I thought Cynthia looked like Alec Mato. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I found Cynthia also a captivating character. Yes, very mm -hmm. good. Um, she's still monitoring the turtles, and she's saying that we need to capture them, but it's not going to be easy. 
So let's bring out Shredder. Mm -hmm. And then we see Shredder in the distance. Like Darth Vader. The mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I mean, really, I did not think I was... I liked the trailer. I did like the trailer as well. So I, I was looking forward to something pleasant, but I think... I, I was just not expecting to be so kind of touched and, and laugh so much. It's it's really poignant and very well written. A really nice vibe to it. Well, let's talk about the vibe because the soundtrack and just like the the, the dialogue, I feel like this is what Transformers: Rise of the Beast was wishing for. Oh yeah, and they failed miserably. Uh -huh. But this one just feels so fresh and fun, but not like it has very timely references that are not. They don't feel dated. The, it, the, and they won't age egregiously either. No, because right. even though some of them are very specific and are technically dated, I think that because there's so much, these characters are so charming that it, it would still work 20 years from now. I agree. Uh, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross did the original score for it, but the, uh, soundtrack, the soundtrack selection is pretty damn good too. Wow, so uh, there's one song in particular we can talk about, but we get like a tribe called Quest. We get Vanilla Ice's Turtle Power song that mm -hmm. he did in one of those movies. But this film has the best use of four non-blondes, What's Going On. I didn't need, uh, no, I needed the Power Horse Workout remix. Oh my <laughs> God, it's it's like the, yeah, the perfect use of that remix. Because that was immediately what I put on in the car when I got it. Because it's used uh, over a chase sequence. Oh, it's just so good. It's so good. A Tribe Called Quest, Can I Kick It, is kind of right, the finale song right before the end credits. And that just has, that. that's like a cherry on top how that song feels on top of this film. Okay, I gotta get through these notes. So when the turtles, one downside to the film is the, the turtles really aren't distinguishable to me. We don't even, we only hear their names like once when they, actually we don't even hear them all say their names at once. Well, they're using nicknames. Like, so I was very confused like which one is which, but, um, so I'm just calling them the turtles. They end up going to like an outdoor movie night and they watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And we actually see the film like live action. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cute. That was cute. I, oh, the look of the film. I well, it's uh, computer animated. It's Nickelodeon's first. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think it looks really, I really. I think cool. it looks really good. It I, almost looks like paper. Yes, I would agree with that. Like a comic book. Uh, I I think some. I think not all four stand out equally. I think Leonardo does because he's being crafted as the leader <laughs> in Michelangelo's Rage and Donatello. Uh, is the one with the glasses. He's the he's the smart one that reads all the comic books and he knows how to defeat Superfly. Um, the one that st stuck out the, the least to me was Raphael, I think. Which one has the missing tooth? That's the one who has the anger issues. It's oh. Michelangelo, isn't it? Yeah, I, I I really couldn't tell them apart. I mean, I they have different personalities, and as I'm watching them, I follow. But like now sitting here, I could I didn't know which ones. They which. do, and now I'm wondering if I got. I mixed up some of those, but yeah, it doesn't see, matter. So. It's, a, it's a reason to rewatch it. Notably, it was written by Roe, Seth Rogen, and Evan Goldberg. Uh, Seth Rogen also produced, and uh, he does the voice of Bebop. Uh oh. There's a moment when one of the turtles is arguing with another in front of their dad, Splinter, and they go, like, You ratted us out. And Splinter says, Don't use that word that way in front of me. <laughs> uh, Jackie Chan <laughs> is so cute. So charming. So cute. That kid, I just want to give that nasty big ass rat a hug. It, he's so cute. And then he develops a romance with um, Scumbug. Which is like this bug that vomits and he's like, yeah, he's found like love. April O'Neil, <laughs> he's like, do you know how hard it is to find a mutant who's my age? And April O'Neil describes Scumbug as a lady cockroach. Oh my God, so gross. Um, you already alluded to Splinter teaching the turtles like martial arts. So we get like, because he tells their origin story, which was a really cute montage. But they start off with uh, Carrie Lee's Guide to Self-Defense, which is a real thing, and it's mm -hmm. funny. And then also we see that they watch a lot of like different martial arts films. Mm -hmm. And that, and like I, I think we get uh, Wu-Tang Clan over that, but <laughs> it was really good. So April is voiced by Ayo Edabiri, who, after seeing her in Bottoms and Theater Camp, like... What a funny, talented person. I don't know. Yes, She's... and I thought April, that character is so charming. I really mm -hmm. liked how she looked, like how the character's drawn. Her little legs. <laughs> yeah, she has like little stumpy legs. She's really, really cute. Mm -hmm. And then the message of the film, um, I, th I think, is really sweet about acceptance. But, but it's very subtle. Well, acceptance in the fact that 
you know, when April says, you would have been scary to me had you just popped out of me, but since you helped me, it, it warmed me up to you. Yeah. And, you, you know, much how we navigate it's the world. It's real. That's, that's how the human experience right there is like you have to you have to step outside of yourself and get to know people and want to get to know other people's experiences. But. There are so many funny lines of dialogue. There's no way I could write them down. Right. But I did do a few. At one point, someone tells one of the turtles they look like if you mix Stewie with Arnold from Hey Arnold. I thought that was funny. <laughs> then someone calls them little Shreks. Mm -hmm. I thought that was funny. Oh, yeah, because they beat down everybody in this chop shop. When April first meets the turtles, um, she thinks they're wearing costumes. And she goes, I don't think all of the good animals were taken. Yeah, like, why like, you, why? like you could have chosen better animal costumes. Well, why are you totals? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, why are you totals? So we find out that April, she sells herself in the beginning kind of like a cool cat, but we realize when they visit her school that she gets bullied and everyone calls her <laughs> oh, April Pukes because she did like a TV broadcast for like school and she vomited mm -hmm. and that scene is hilarious because she's vomiting out of control mm -hmm. but in the end after she helps save because in the end when the turtles are fighting Superfly the, the villain she gets on like CNN and announces live that the turtles are trying to help humans so now on her locker where it said April Pukes, now it says April O'Hero. I thought that was really sweet. Yeah, there's so many really sweet moments, but that aren't corny no. and schmaltzy. April's notebook, when after she meets the turtles, she has her notebook and she's writing all these questions to ask them when she talks to them again. And some of them are really funny. She's like, uh, have you got, did you guys get COVID? <laughs> yeah, have you ever had COVID? <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Splinter realizes that his children are leaving to go be out in the real world so he decides i'm going to throw you a surprise party and he has humans there but they're just like life-size posters of the three chrises chris pratt chris evans and chris pine <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and he's, he's bought them a bunch of pizza and then after they leave he's looking through a shoebox of old photos and mr lonely is playing <laughs> it's so sad oh i I have to rewatch this movie just for Ice Cube. The it, like the voice work, the dialogue is perfection because that character has sort of like he, there are a lot of hip hop references tied into what he's saying, which is so funny. I, I mean, I can't even recall them all, but there's one moment when he's explaining he wants to kill all the humans, and the other mutants are like, "Well, what's going to happen to the humans? Like, what's going to happen to the humans?" And he goes, "Nothing good." And then they're like, "Well, no." He says, "Maybe we can play with them like they play with animals." And at one point he says, well, maybe we can have like some fat booty boy races. Like what? <laughs> that had me on the floor. When he becomes super duper fly and he's a amalgamation of all kinds of animals. And oh, it's so funny. He's like, I got a whale tail. I got horses for legs. Like, oh, it's so good. He's stomping around New York and he's like, y'all yeah, thought I was going to be Godzilla. Nah. <laughs> oh, so good. So Splinter, there's this running joke that Splinter thinks that humans want to milk them. Mm -hmm. And then the turtles keep saying, we don't have nipples. They're not trying to milk us. But then when TCRI captures them, when Maya Rudolph captures them, she attaches their asses to a milking machine. And I thought that was so funny. And then when Splinter shows up to save them, he's like, I knew it, a milking machine. <laughs> And there's also a good visual gag because Cynthia's like, well, um, you'll melt them until we get the required quantity. And, and then the quantity... The, the beaker is... It's like a silo. It's like... The, <laughs> it's more fluid than these poor turtles have. Oh, and speaking of Superfly, that's a really nice reference to one of the best black exploitation films, which is Superfly starring Ron O'Neill. Well, when Super Duper Fly captures the turtles, he's cracking their shells, which was like, oh no... And then he's like, ooh, your shells are tough. Like, it's cracking a pistachio. <laughs> but we see their little shells crack. And they have... So, at the very beginning of the film, we learn about the anti-mutant neutralizer that TCRI has. So that's what they're trying to get Super Duper Fly with. And they shoot him. And it's just one little capsule that hits, like, a portion of his leg. And it basically neutralizes... Like, one horse off of his big-ass leg. And he's like, oh, one horse? I don't need that horse. But I thought it was a really cute moment. And this is when we kind of get their four personalities where they go, we can't give up. Each of us has a talent. They explain their talent. And then they realize the the, the way to defeat this big ass fly, because he has a blowhole, because he's also part whale, 
is they need to drop this anti-mutant thing into his blowhole, which of course they do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it. The only downside to this movie, I think, is again the differentiating the four turtles. I don't think. I mean, clearly sitting here after just watching it, I, I don't know which one's which. Also, this feels like the first two episodes of like a TV show. Oh, but it's been so long since I've seen something that's familiar and nostalgic. And I'm like, I'm actually excited to see where these people are going oh, yeah. with this material. And I laughed so much. So I did too. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, I mean, as a kid, I was, I had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I was a fan. I saw the 1990 film with my mom. I did as theater. well. Yeah. Um, but even if there is a little iffiness uh, about differentiating the turtles and their personalities, I think this is the first time that uh, actual teenage boys have voiced these characters, and I thought oh. they, I thought they all did a really good job. They were so cute. Mm-hmm. Just all of it is so well done. Uh, Shimon Brown Jr. was Michelangelo. Uh, Mika Abbey was Donatello. Raphael was Brady Noon, and Nicholas Cantu was Leonardo. Good job, people. Mm-hmm. What would you give this film? Four and a half. Wow. I really liked it. I would give it four out of five. I thought it was excellent. Anything else? What's going on? <laughs> Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>